Good afternoon and welcome to another edition of Viking Voices. On this podcast as part of Black History Month, I'm chatting with some of our former and current student athletes and coaches, past and present, to hear their story and learn more about their journey to Western and what this month means to them. Kiana Gandhi is our guest today. Uh, Kiana, thanks for letting us uh, interview you. You're down in Atlanta and man, it's so good to see you, a Viking legend right here. On I uh, started 63 straight games to, to end your career, your junior and senior year. Um, you scored 1,023 uh, points in your career, uh, part of an elite 1,000-point club, and just an all-around amazing student athlete at Western. And we are excited to talk to you on this podcast. We'll share some stories about Western, about playing for Carmen and Stacy, and also about Black History Month and what you're up to down in Atlanta as a, as a mentor to you. Uh, so thanks for joining us. What's going on? Ah, thank you so much for having me. Thanks for that amazing intro. Um, it kind of, your part froze a little bit for me. So hopefully during that time, I didn't look too crazy. But um, yeah, so I'm living in Atlanta, Georgia now. I've been here since June of 2018. So I think, um, yeah, oh my gosh, that sounds so long ago. So <laughs> been here in June of 2018, moved down here for graduate school. Um, for clinical mental health counseling. So did that, graduated in May of 2020. And then my plan was to maybe move back to Washington. Didn't turn out that way. Like I love Atlanta. Um, don't know if I love the whole state of Georgia yet, but I love, absolutely love Atlanta. So I've been down here um, working as a psychotherapist for a few months now. Um, and that's been awesome and amazing. And um, just at the beginning of this year, so just last month launched a business called Headscarves and Healing that's really centered around Black millennials and um, even people that are not able, able to access therapy or don't want to go to therapy. Like what are some things they can do to um, just be more healthy and well? Well, we'll get into a little bit of that later because um, there's some great stuff that, that you've told me about your, your career and what you're doing now. But tell us what you graduated with in Western at, from what degree and then uh, where did you attend graduate school and what was that master's in? So I mastered in, um, sorry, not mastered. I got my bachelor's degree at Western in psychology in that, like I knew that from day one, that's what it was gonna be. So I was on the psychology track the whole time. I had a minor in sociology. And then when I applied to grad school, that was obviously helpful because I'm in the clinical mental, I was in the clinical mental health program at Georgia State. Um, and so most of the people had, you know, psychology backgrounds. And for me, my degree at Western was also like a um, bachelor's of science, which was really helpful because it was more geared torn towards the brain and the neurocognitive part, which was really helpful for my master's program. It's pretty amazing, the track. And, uh, you know, you're a, you're a young, powerful lady down there and, and just kicking some tail end. It's really neat to see only a few years after graduation, the things that you've achieved. Um, you made us proud on the court, obviously, and uh, making us proud now. But you're part of an amazing program at Western. Um, anytime we talk women's basketball, we talk Linda Goodrich, Carmen Dolfo, and the many, many, many amazing student athletes that have come through Carver Gym. Tell us a little bit about your, your time on the hardwood at, at, at Western. Um, some of the top moments that you remember of your teammates, you had a special graduating class, um, and just playing under Carmen and Stacy, who was your assistant coach. Talk about how that helped you get to where you are today. Yeah, so coming into Western as a little freshman uh, in 2012, I think, is when I, when I first got to campus. And the learning curve was like literally this steep. Like it wasn't even really a curve. It was just like, I'm down here and I need to get up here. And for me, the biggest thing was the work ethic. Like things in high school came pretty naturally to me. Like I think I worked hard, but it, I never like overextended myself. Um, and had a pretty successful career. And so I got to Western and that just was not the case at all. Um, even with like five minutes early is Carmen's thing, like you're not ever gonna be anywhere on time. So just the structure was very different for me. I'm very much like I'll walk in maybe a minute. I mean, I probably got on this like a minute before. Um, and so it was, a, it was definitely a learning curve. One thing that helped me immensely was just the examples. So it was helpful to have people that have been on the program two, three, four years in a row. So for me, it was easy to tell what was expected of me. And so I caught on very quick because um, everyone had the same standard. Like if the seniors were expected to be five minutes early, so were the redshirt freshmen, like it didn't change. Um, 
And so I would say top moments, hmm, top moments. I would say one of my top moments was, I think I was a sophomore and we had a game on Root Sports against Simon Frazier. Um, and so that was, I had, a, I had a nice game that game. So I think that plus it being on TV, plus like friends and family were able to watch it. Plus we won. That probably is up there as a top moment. My senior year, we played, we were, we were playing at Whatcom and it was a Valentine's Day game and we had beaten NNU. Um, and that, that was a top moment. I don't really remember why, but I think it might've been the pink is sticking in my memory for some reason. Um, anytime going to regionals was always like a end of the season, things are getting very serious, um, very focused. So our last one going to, um, the tournament in Anchorage was, even though it didn't end up the way we wanted it to, um, that one was really a, everyone, we need everyone to contribute. We had a really, really talented team, um, my senior class. And so that was the most that I think we had really come together and said, okay, what do we need to do? to like execute um, communication. And even though the game didn't turn out the way we wanted to, that I think was a big step up in everyone's leadership senior class that you were a part of uh, was pretty special. I'm going to forget mm -hmm. some, but Tia Briggs, Taylor Peacock, Rachel Albert, uh, yourself, uh, you guys provided a mentorship to a group that's now playing after you, but you also were able to learn as a red shirt and as a freshman from the Kayla Burnsons and the Sydney Donaldsons, and um, I'm leaving some names out, but talk about that, that tradition that is Western basketball where you learn and then you help teach, you learn, you help mentor. Um, how special is that? And how, how gratifying was that for you to help kind of pass the torch onto the next group? Yeah, so um, I think one thing that Carmen does really well is the responsibility looks different as you move through your time at Western. So um, even though we have the same requirements as far as like being on time or having your shoes or whatever, but um, as far as responsibility or how quickly I'm expecting you to either like learn this play or, um, you know, remember to block out or just things like that, the responsibility grew as we got older. And for me, that was really helpful um, because one, I wasn't super stressed out as a freshman. Like I have to know everything right now it was very understandable that you're going to learn as you go. And so being able to see older players have that responsibility and handle that responsibility well um, and manage it really appropriately because they also didn't look at you and expect you to know everything right off the bat. And so me um, in my junior and senior year, um, you know, when, when freshmen come in, I'm just like, I cannot believe that I literally was just a freshman. Like the time moves so fast that you just have all this empathy because you're like, listen, I didn't know the plays. I didn't, I didn't, you know, it's just all these lists of things. I'm like, I've been late before. It's not the end of the world. Like I've worn the wrong shirt before. It's not the end of the world. So there's just all these things that you're able to say, hey, like it's okay. And I think the the main thing is just helping younger players with nerves. Um, Cause I think that is something that's that's consistent. So I remember like Kayla, Sydney, we've had those conversations before. And so having it again with someone younger, it was like, don't even, don't even worry about it because she's she's more concerned about you know, the older players doing the things that they already know rather than you being on our level right away. Absolutely. It's quite the program. I know a lot of things are learned as a student athlete, especially as a member of that program. But I wanted to take this chance to, you know, next couple of questions is to ask you about uh, Black History Month. You know, it is, uh, it is timely and we visited with student athletes past, present and before, but we're taking this month to dedicate it to talking to um, student athletes of, Black student athletes across the history of our programs. So I want to ask you, what does this month mean to you? You're down in Atlanta, um, a lot of history down there, and you were just part of a movement um, in the voting area where um, you all made a huge impact. Um, talk about that, what this history month, what history means to you, Black History Month, and then also what are some of those things that you've uh, gone through lately that have, that have been just kind of eye-opening? Yeah. Um, yeah, so Black History Month for me ever, I mean, for I think the past few years, but it's kind of been like a year long thing, right? Like, I think it's really good for everyone in the, in the country really to turn their attention towards like Black historians and inventors and activists. 
Um, but for me, it's like a, every day, how much can I learn? Like every day, what else is, some, what's something new that I didn't know before? Um, and really, fo and especially just for me, looking more about, uh, looking more into like the black history in my own family, because I think the, you know, you get the big names, the Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, um, and rightfully so. But for me, it was more so like, how does black his like, how am I black history? Like, how is my grandma black history? How is her grandparents black history? Um, and what it, what was their contribution? Um, and so being in Atlanta for the past few months has been amazing because the camaraderie, the support, just like the advocacy I've seen, um, like black people just rally around other black people and say, hey, we have a job that we need to do. Uh, it was extremely powerful, extremely powerful. And I think, um, you know, if you move from like Washington to the South and everyone's gonna be like, oh, it's so different. And it's, oh, you're in the South, the Bible Belt. And there's so much racism and prejudice would, I mean, it's everywhere. It's not just in Southern states, but for me, that just was not my experience at all. Um, my experience and at least the, the communities that I'm surrounded in, it was always centered around love and openness. Um, and so during the past presidential elections in the, um, the Senate elections, that's all that I saw was just people coming together, like whatever needs to be done, that's what's gonna be need, that's what's you know gonna need to be done. And that was also part of black history. Like that election is gonna be in history books. So it was just really cool to be able to see it, you know, firsthand. You followed in the footsteps of your father who played basketball at Western uh, Joe in the in the early 1980s. Um, did he ever share any of his experiences as a young black man um, playing college sports and, and coming up to Bellingham? And and uh, what did you kind of learn? Uh, from the path that he paved. And you also talked about the path, you know, learning more about your grandparents and all that. So um, tell us a little bit about your father playing basketball at Western, maybe some of those stories that you've heard or what you learned from him. Yeah, so my dad went to um, Charles Wright High School and then went to Western um, in, I think, 82 is when he got there. I don't know. I'm sure you'll fact check that. Um, <laughs> But he was, so he, he gets there. Um, and of course, like his main focus is basketball. I don't think anyone's surprised by that. But for him, I mean, it was going from a predominantly white high school to a predominantly white university. And for him, you know, when you learn how to kind of like survive and adapt in those spaces that it's almost like second nature. Um, and for my conversations with him, that that is what it was. I think when I spoke with him, looking at where the team was when he was a player and looking at where the team is now, it's much more diverse. Um, and so that was something that he noticed just coming to my games and like, you know, if the men played after us, looking at the team, looking at, um, you know, who's still there in administration, who's new on the team. So just like the, their tradition still being there, right? But then also like, I'm seeing new faces, I'm seeing more diversity. Um, and for him, it was really like, this is a new, space this is you know a university campus but the way i'm going to adapt and kind of find where i fit in was really the same for him he didn't really um express um any like specific instances that were like this was really a, a turning point or this was really difficult to get through um and i think that was also similar to my experience right so i went to matt rainier high school which was a predominantly white high school and then transitioned to western um, when really the biggest thing that changed was just the amount of people, like my school, my high school was I think a thousand and Western was like 15,000. So I think for me, not being reflected in the student body was normal for me. Um, and so I learned how to adapt and like, okay, these are, you know, kind of the people in my corner where I know if I'm having a hard day and that I'm going to go to or things like that. And my dad had the same experience. I believe your grandfather, there's a story there where he has some basketball uh, kind of some uniqueness is right. Can you tell us a little bit about your grandfather and 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 uh, and what his little uh, corner of the world was? I believe he was uh, was on the news for some things. Yeah, yeah. So my grand my grandfather on my mom's side, so my mom's dad is the self proclaimed jump rope king for a number of years, and so uh, he he a few years ago went on the Steve Harvey show that was called Forever Young, and it highlighted. Um, older adults like doing things that are really miraculous and amazing. And so he went on there, set a record for like the oldest, fastest jump roper in like under a minute or something like that. So now he really like literally is the jump rope king. Like he has a whole record and everything. Um, and I think he actually broke his own record a few years later. So he, 
yeah, he came into Western um, to like do one of our conditioning days with jump rope. And so everyone got to meet him and then the coaches loved him and they live really close to um, St. Martin. So anytime we had a game there, they're like, oh, where's your, where's your grandpa at? And I mean, he has the hat with his name on it, the shirt. So he's very hard to miss. He's very hard to miss, but was a huge supporter um, of the team the whole time I was there. They pretty cool stories uh, about your grandfather and your father. So thanks for sharing those with us. Um, you know, you were a black student athlete at Western. Like you mentioned, it was a predominantly white um, situation for your father and a little bit for you. But what were some of the experiences as a student athlete um, that really helped you get to where you are? And what were some of the obstacles and challenges that you maybe had to overcome uh, moving up to Western and to Bellingham? Yeah, so um, I would say obstacles had to overcome. I just think it was outside of my support system. So I had to find what that looked like. Um, and I think just Whatcom County, the city of Bellingham is, is not, is not, um, it's just not, it's not a high population of black people in general. So even stuff like finding hair care products was like, how far am I going to have to drive? Um, things like that, where I did feel very out of place. And I think for me, basketball was kind of like an escape. Um, but I think just like the rest of the country that there's a lot of work to still be done um, as far as even like what a, what a sports team looks like, right? So you have athletes that come to campuses and the majority of black students that I saw were on basketball team, track team, um, volleyball team, things like that. And yet there still is a huge disproportionate amount of white student athletes, right? When I think that uh, one, we're striving for like inclusion because we want, I think it's important for like sports teams and corporate America to look like the world looks, right? So that's having people look very different in all different types of shades. Um, so I think when I was there, there was um, in like teammates of mine where we would talk about it openly, like, oh man, we're getting a recruit and she's black. Like it was a big deal because every single person that you see yourself reflected in is just another sense of like, okay, I belong here in this space. Like I'm invited in this space. Um, and so, I mean, I think, I mean, sports teams should look like rainbows. I think there's a long way to go before that happens. But for me, that was one of the biggest challenges. Um, and I just even think just things like communication style, or, you know, like, oh, we're getting together as a team. What food are we going to eat? Just things like that, that weren't problems, but just things that were, I was maybe more aware of as a black student athlete, where other people I just don't think would know, you know, like, oh, you go out play a good game and it's not really brought up. So I think kind of just like lifestyle was really one of the biggest obstacles um, through my time there. But again, still being intentional about finding those people along the way. Do you have someone in Black history um, that you look up to and, and, and why and, and how that person inspires you? You mentioned the, the, the names, um, Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King and all, and there's a lot of that that people go to, but is there someone that you look up to that's maybe not, um, you know, maybe is a coach, is, a, is, a, is an athlete, is a poet? Is there someone that you look up to for inspiration? Yeah, so this might be super cliche, but my grandmother um, and grandfather have been instrumental even from when I was a child just opening my eyes to how much history you have to be proud of and not um, you know your skin being something that you're ashamed of and so in the state capitol they actually were acknowledged for like in the display of like the year 1968 of being activists within Thurston County and being like the largest black landowners in Thurston County um, you know, they've been trailblazers <laughs> in Olympia and Lacey for a really long time. And so my grandparents for me are people that show me like the work is never to be done. My grandpa just led the campaign for I-1000 that unfortunately didn't win and go through. But I mean, for him to be in his 70 plus years old and really starting all these new things, it's like black history is never over. And he's still making history as I'm alive, that my kids are going to learn about that their kids, you know? And so for me, I would just say my grandparents, and it's really cool to know enough about them to even say like, they are a part of black history. Is there a quote or a saying by someone that you kind of use as inspiration? It kind of goes back to maybe your, you know, your grandparents are you look up to, but is there a quote that you write down or someone in black history that's provided an inspirational moment for you that reminds you of, 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 of the, the, the path that you're on and the, yeah. and the goals that have you set for yourself? 
Right. Yes, I do. So this quote, I actually don't know who said it. They might be black. They might not be black. I'm not sure. But um, it says a bird doesn't sing because it has answers. A bird sings because it has a song. And for me, what that really means is like every single person has a story that's important. And whether you have an audience to share it with or whether you're by yourself, like your voice matters. And so for me, that that ties into every single day. So whether I'm with a client that thinks their voice doesn't matter. I have moments where I feel like my voice might not matter that every single person has something inside of them that whether or not it might be right or accepted, like it's valid because you are a human being. So that's my, one of my favorite. That's a great one. Um, Kiana, there's been a lot of things going on in the world over the last year specifically. It, it's been going on forever. But with the voting stuff that's going on, the untimely deaths that have been, that have happened, um, how do you, how has that made you feel as a, as a, as a young, powerful black woman? And how have you tried to just make this world a better place? Yeah. So I think, um, as far as how it made me feel, I think how I think black people are expected to feel. So it's devastating. It's depressing. Um, it's also not anything new. So almost at least for myself, almost getting to this numb point, um, like this heightened emotion and then going back numb and then really, really upset and then going back numb and then being really engaged and turning off my phone, right? So having these ups and downs and just regulating kind of what I'm able to take in because um, I think the more you look for it, the more you're gonna find it. Some of these stories are just, you know, gonna be on the news and no one can avoid them. But I think for a lot of people, there's, only maybe 5% makes it to the general population. Um, and so that it, it does, you know, by the time you're done grieving, maybe one thing, then another thing is popping up. And at the same time, you might be worried about your job security. At the same time, you might be saying, oh, well, I feel really detached. I'm getting lonely. And at the same time, oh, someone else just got shot. So it's, it's a, I think, a constant flow of things that it never really goes away. But I think for me, it was just about regulating how much I'm able to Watch, like literally watch or I have to put my phone down, turn the TV off and things like that. As in, uh, how do you tell, what do you tell non-Black people that want to join in the fight against some of this? And how, how, what's a good way to help and to address some of this? Since some of those things that, you know, you, you see on social media and you see on the news and you see what's going on, what, what do you say to those people? How, how can people help out um, the, the fight against racism and, and to make sure there's inclusion in the workplace. Like you said, a, a team should look like a rainbow. How, how can we help? I don't want to, you know, I don't want to put you too much in the spot, but how, how can we help? Yeah. Um, so I think first and foremost, that like, for me, I don't do a lot of like, when I'm talking about maybe like activism or advocacy, like it's usually with other black people. Right. And I think for white people, it's easy to kind of get into this of like, how can I come alongside you instead of like, how can I just take the reins? Because racism is really like a white person's problem. You know what I mean? Like, so for if black people are receiving the brunt end of it, it's not really on black people to fix it. Um, and so for me, it's from like learning and trial and error that really the space that I'm in is like, working alongside other black people. And then there could be, if there's like a white organization or a white voting group um, to collaborate in what ways seem necessary. But from what I've seen, like there are white people reaching out to other white people and saying, hey, this is our problem. Like we don't need to go to any more black people to tell us what to do. Like there's enough information and we've seen enough. And you know, there's ways that we can teach our kids different things. And there's ways we can talk to our church groups about different things. Um, without Black people being a part of it. And I think at the same time, doing work separately is still going to help everyone come together. That's a great answer. That's a great answer, <laughs> Kiana. Um, and I just learned a lot from that. So thank you. Um, <laughs> you. You mentioned early on in this conversation about what you're doing right now. And a lot of it has to do with mental health advocacy. And that, you know, I'm a father of two kids. Um, mental health among our youth, whether it's, it's everyone, is, 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 a, is a big thing right now. And, and you're doing a yeoman's effort to try and address that and work with it and advocate for it. Um, tell us a little bit of what's going on with working with our youth right now, especially in the inner city, 
some of the problems and issues that you deal with on a daily basis and, um, you know, ultimately what your goals are working in this area, because what you're doing is so important for the future of America. Yeah, so kids are struggling right now. I think as well as most adults are just like being in the house and then online learning for a lot of children is helpful. And for a lot of children, it's inaccessible or it's just not con conducive. Like I couldn't be on a computer screen all day listening to someone. So I can only imagine in the mind of like a seven year old how difficult that is. And so what I think a lot of parents are seeing is like this dysregulation with their children or maybe notice they're not paying attention like I want them to. Um, I'm really concerned that they have ADHD, um, you know, they're, or maybe they're acting out and you're seeing more defiant behaviors or things like that. So I think what you see in children is what I would expect if I was a child going through something like this, right? And so my work with children is really centered around getting them regulated, like having them be aware of their bodies. What are some coping mechanisms that we can do? Um, and then also working with parents to say, hey, what's maybe the best way that we can address this? Or what's the best way that we can discipline around this one area? Um, so that it's not just like on the child to change, but also it's gonna be a community effort. Um, and so, yeah, I've heard, I mean, there's been an, an overwhelming amount of parents that are like, what is happening to my child? I'm like, it's okay, they're just in the house. Like, this is not the end of the world, you know? Um, everyone's gonna adjust differently. Adults are adjusting very different, differently as well. So um, the kids will be all right. I think kids that are growing up during this time are going to have some resilience that other children might have not needed to, to tap into so early. Um, but also, I know families are going through a very difficult time, especially if you're, you're a parent that has to work full time from home or outside of the home, and then you have a child at home doing school full time, um, that it's nearly impossible. But parents are making a way because they're prioritizing their children, which is um, very, very commendable. Sounds like there's a lot of parallels between what you're doing right now and kind of also when you were a student athlete of leading a team and, and, and you know, making decisions on the run and solving problems, have you been able to draw a lot from your, your, your new career into kind of what, what you were doing on the court um, and solving those problems and helping direct um, a team? There, there's some parallels there. I know that, uh, you know, we take our, pro as a department, we, a lot of pride in how our student athletes develop Mm -hmm. and then lead and uh you're a shining example of that so would you say that there's a lot of parallels uh, between the two of, of what you're doing right now <sighs> yes i would say first and foremost like communication skills i cannot stress enough how western opened my eyes not only to how important they are but just like how many different people receive information a different way so like if i have one teammate i know i can just scream at and it's not a problem and another teammate like i know that's not going to work um, that's something I have to know. That's not, you know, that, that's something that I have to know and in, in the flying in the moment. And um, the thing I love about Carmen is Carmen is going to say what she wants to say, right? And I think for us, especially as women athletes, that was so important to see um, a woman at the top of her profession say, like, you can feel how you want to feel about it, but this is the goal at the end of the day. So being very goal directed and at the, you know, at the at the final checkpoint, like regardless of the way something is communicated, it was always letting me know, I'm saying this with love and I'm saying this for your benefit. And so I think for me, that's something that I constantly lead, lead with is this might be hard to hear, but this is going to benefit you at the end of the day. So um, being able to quick up, pick up really quickly how people respond to different, you know, just language and tone, um, and just being aware of that and just as a black woman, just being aware of how I show up in different spaces and, and as a woman, just being aware of, um, like kind of how the, the feedback I'm getting, what's working, what's not working, and then adjusting as I see fit. Well, Kiana, it's really eye-opening and great to talk to you. And I can't commend you enough about the work that you're doing as, you know, you've used the terms advocate and mental health and, um, just what you're doing right now is making a huge difference. I think we all knew it when we saw you uh, on the court and leading and slashing and going to the going to the rim and all those things. But now, what you're doing, getting your masters and uh, and leading the future, it's it's really really special. Uh, we're very very proud of you. The things that you had to say about Black History Month and you know your grandparents and your father, 
Um, and, and what all that meant to you in, in playing in Bellingham was, it, it was really educational. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for conversing us in an honest way. And thank you for sharing so many great stories. Yes, it was my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, Jeff. I'm so happy you thought about me for this. And, and I definitely think that we need to follow up down the road and keep these conversations going. And, um, you know, we're, store, we're sharing a lot of great stories that, that we're learning about, um, about, about Black history um, from all across our history. And you're a big piece of that. And we can't wait to see the amazing things that you're doing in the future. And follow your company and follow what you're doing down in Atlanta. And hopefully you make your way, way back up to the Northwest if it, if it makes sense and we can see you a little bit more often. So thank you for joining us, Kiana. Um, good luck with everything and go Vikings. Awesome, thanks Jeff.